I have a bit of good news. All right. So I know New Year's coming up. Plenty of, plenty of you is pro- have probably made New, Year, New Year's resolutions, right? You know, and if you haven't, you know, you'll start thinking about it that night as you see the ball drop. You're like, maybe I should do better because I know I, I could at least stop eating the way I do. <laughs> but here's the good news. See, some guy in the Paul, named Paul in the Bible, he didn't say, I renew myself with God every new year. No, he said, I die daily, right? So, you know, and that doesn't even mean daily. That means you die every moment. Your spirit self is being put down every moment so that you can glorify God through yourself. See, he can show himself through you. So that's just a bit of inspiration and hope. So I wanted to, you know, spring forward to the new year so I can justify this Christmas message. So y'all think I'm a little bit on theme. But my message to you tonight is the courage to submit. All right, let us pray. Dear Lord God, we come to you right now just to magnify you and glorify you, Lord God. We pray that our presence here being together, Lord, draws your spirit as we know it wills, Lord. And we pray that it just exalts your name on high, Lord God. And we pray that the people out there are anointed to hear this message, Lord. But I pray that you anoint me to speak this message, Lord, because without you behind my words, without the Holy Spirit behind my words, my words mean nothing, Lord. So I pray that you feel me with that presence, Lord, and help me to speak this and to speak truth, Lord. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So as you all know, life always goes according to plan, right? So, you know, I'm sure you have this detailed calendar and schedule, and you hit every point on it every day. Check off your list, right? See, quite the opposite. At this point, I plan a lot less than I used to because everything's often up in the air. And I know what you're thinking. Pastor Nate, you're 22. Things haven't even started for you yet. (laughs) Maybe you're right. (laughs) But, you know, just between the ages of 17 and 22, things have been a whirlwind. So there's a lot to come, right? (laughs) So the thing that makes this difficult is in the society we live in, we like to cram as much into a day as possible, right? If you don't have a busy day, like say I have a day off of work. Before my day off even gets there, that day's packed. Like, you know, things will just come up and it'll fill that schedule before it's even time to get there. But see, it's because we have a society based on productivity and planning every step of the day to make it happen. So uh, currently, I am two for four on getting to see my family for Christmas in the last four years. Two years ago, I had the flu. And this year, my wife had COVID and we had to quarantine. So Christmas hasn't gone quite according to plan for me. So if you went into my house right now, um, you would see a bunch of unwrapped gifts under the tree because we haven't even gotten to that step yet. (laughs) But while by no means do I believe God has forced these circumstances onto me, I believe it has opened my eyes to a certain perspective. See, Christmas is not about the perfect celebration, but at the beginning of it all, God interrupting the plan of man. See, that's, that's the center and basis of the Christmas story, God interrupting the plans of man. So, you see, many of us think that we are fully licensed drivers ready to go on the streets of golden heaven, when in reality, God's holding the brake in the student driver vehicle, telling us to park the car for a second. See, maybe you don't see the giant pothole 300 feet ahead of you, but God knew it was there before it was ever created. <laughs> to put it simply, God overturns many of our plans for reasons we don't understand, and he does so for his glory and for our good. So where does our role come into play in the grand scheme of things? Are we to fly in the skies and save our fellow man, or are we to lead the charge and cause for there to be no war or starvation overnight? Are we, or are we to simply submit? See, the latter holds true based on God's word, and we can see this in the life of a young woman named Mary. See, Mary had plans. In fact, this may have been the busiest part of her life to date. She had a lot going on. So who's been ever been involved in planning a wedding? Anyone? Uh, for those that you have had, I'm, I'm no genius on Jewish weddings, but wedding planning is exhausting. See, how much food do we need? How many tables do we have to set? Who goes where? Who wears what? How do I time everything perfectly? You know, 
It's supposed to be the, the greatest time of your life, and that moment may be, but I can guarantee you everything leading up to that is the most stressful part of your life. So, you know, even in the wedding at Cana, they ran out of wine. You know, their planning didn't work out. But I said again, Mary had plans. However, God had different plans. I'm sure all of you have ran into an unexpected crisis in your life, whether it be the loss of a job, sickness, the loss of a loved one. Many times we don't understand why God allowed something like that to happen to us. So I encourage you to take a look at how Mary handles all of this and how she displays a submission to God that we can all learn from. So if you can, um, want to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, we're going to read verses 26 through 38. But don't worry, it'll be broken up. Now, in the, in the sixth month of the angel, um, month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph at the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting was this. So Mary had a pretty ordinary plan, a life planned out. And marrying in her later teens to a man named Joseph. So, I mean, Joseph was a pretty common name back there and getting married at that time. So it was, it all screamed ordinary. You know, this is what she was supposed to do by cultural standards. This was the route that she was going to take. So, you know, maybe she was just sitting in the house, flipping through her wedding catalog and trying to plan things out. No, I'm just <laughs> messing. But, you know, she probably was during that time thinking about her life a lot and how things were going to go out. And she saw it going this clear cut, cut path. But then an angel comes in. Now, this is just an interesting side note, but notice it says the angel comes in. It doesn't say the angel appeared. You know, we always think of the angel just coming out of nowhere, but essentially it sounds like an angel just walked through her front door, you know. So being startled, not because of just of how angels look, but that's, that's a pretty startling thing to encounter. So it's just interesting to think about. But we're going to continue reading in verse 30. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his in and of his kingdom. There will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered her and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Mary had just been told by God that she would give birth to the Savior of the world. How do you react to that? Because I, I don't think I could react to that. And <laughs> that's some information that's just so overwhelming. But She's gone from this insignificant individual in this rundown part of town to being a key piece in God's plan. You know, that seems to be a pattern by God, right? He chooses the people that you wouldn't think he would choose. You know, if we had to go choose a king, we wouldn't choose the smallest of the sons. If we had to go choose an apostle, we wouldn't choose a murderer. But that's because we don't think like God does. God sees the good in us. God sees the greatness in us that he can use in us through him before we even think of it. And that's such a blessing. See, she encountered a huge blessing that can come with huge headaches due to her being engaged with Joseph and now having a child that isn't his. So immediately, I'm sure panic starts to set in because there are deadly consequences to this. If you know, things hadn't worked out the way they is. If God wasn't involved, this would have been the end of the story. But finishing up our reading in verse 36, it says, Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month of her who, has called, who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. 
So here we get some proof, more proof of God's involvement. I think an angel coming down might be enough for me, but I'm not going to claim that <laughs> I'm perfect either. But so just to add the cherry on top, God said, you know, your cousin that you had that can't give birth to a child, she's six months pregnant. So, and, um, you know, and just, I'm sure he gave some significance of that beyond just it being a normal birth too, because that would go on to be John the Baptist. So God was heavily at work here and Mary saw that. See, Mary's reaction to God's plan is a perfect example though of how we should react when God interrupts our lives. Her obedience to God shows us several things that can make it easier for us to submit. So moving on to my first point for tonight, it's okay to be confused. <laughs> See, in verse 29, it had said, she was troubled at his saying. We feel that only appropriate Christian action, uh, we, we may feel that the only appropriate Christian action at times when our plan changed due to God's will is to be excited. And, you know, have you ever heard something from God and you're like, you don't necessarily feel the best about it at first, but you know, you go, all right, God, I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. And sometimes we don't do that out of a place of true feelings. We do that out of a feeling of obligation as Christians. We think, okay, you know, I'm supposed to be excited for this. So I'm going to fake it till I make it, you know, cause we, we do that in a lot of things and, you know, um, and we'll move on to more of that feeling that comes after next, but this isn't always the case and it's not always realistic. Mary had the normal human response to be confused or perplexed as an angel has just walked into her home to deliver her news that shattered all of her plans and placed her on a completely different course. Being confused allows us to see that we do not understand and to accept that we are in a small part of a grand scheme, which is not, as ba not a bad thing as it shows God is in control. So, you know, when, when you don't have it all figured out, you start to realize that you hope someone else does because you have this life plan and you have it all set out. You know, in school, they try to encourage you to go ahead and pick the school you want to go to, know what job you want to do. And realistically, you're 16 or 17 and <clears throat> that's not realistic. Um, so maybe we, we need to talk to our young ones about relying on God at a much earlier age because that's our jobs as adults and parents and households. But 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 7 through 9 reads, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. <clears throat> See, in verse 8, Paul wrote, we are perplexed, but we're not in despair. God will allow us, allow us to be confused at times so that we will not rely on our understanding, but realize his greatness and holiness and um, follow his will. <clears throat> In verse 7, Paul says, let me go back. <laughs> Paul says, uh, we have, we, uh, our treasures are not in, um, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellent power of God may be in, may, uh, may uh, be of God and not of us. So, you know, this treasure that we do have, everything we have isn't because of us. It's because of God through us, right? So <clears throat> my point number two, it's okay to wrestle with it. Verse 29 also says, and considered what manner of greeting this was. She, um, she sat there and considered it. So how many times do we encounter a change in our lives that God placed there and shrug it off as God's plan and never give it a second thought. You know, how many times you just, um, God says, do this. And you're like, okay, I mean, it's, this is just a slightly different variation because everyone reacts differently. Some of us are like, let's go God. You know, even if it's not real, some of us are like, okay, God, <laughs> and move on. And we're not going to think about it anymore. But God wants us to try to figure it out and wrestle with it. You know, he doesn't expect us to understand it, but that doesn't mean he doesn't want us to try because we need to think about how God has placed it there to help us. Examine your reactions and emotions and chew on the whole situation over and over. This gives us a better understanding of who God is and draws us closer to him. See, don't mull it over and look for a way out, but think about what is going on and look to see how it could be a work of a good God. When we wrestle in a situation, 
in this manner, we give God the opportunity to mold us and change us because we are putting ourselves into motion. Stagnation does not lead the, to growth in God. That makes it easiest for us to see the path God wants us to go down. So if I'm sat there <clears throat> stuck in a, a rut of my own thoughts and my own pity because something has changed in my life, I'm not going anywhere. God cannot use me in that state. Now, does that mean God's plan won't come into fruition? No. He may give you a second chance, but that plan may go to someone else. So it's why it's so important that we sit there and when God tells us something, we don't have to just, you know, we have to accept it, but he doesn't expect us to not be human. <laughs> he knows we're going to sit there and think on it. But us sitting there and thinking on it and talking about it and trying to figure out why we reacted the way we did helps us to start in the motion. It gets that momentum going. You know, one of the laws of physics is an object, a motion stays in no, motion, right? So once he gets us in that motion, it's a lot harder to stop it. <laughs> Rather than if you're staying in motion, uh, staying at rest, you're going to stay at rest. That's me trying to get out of bed in the mornings. So my third point is it's okay to ask questions. Mary said, how can this be? You know, that's a pretty just straightforward question. She's like, how? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of times I've asked God, how? <laughs> there's been good times where I've asked him how, like, wow, you really pulled this off for me. And there's been, not that I doubt God, <laughs> but there's been other times where I asked how, and I'm like, why did this go this way? But, you know, you have to trust he has a plan. It's for your good. It's for his will. So it's okay to ask questions, which kind of ties into the last one, but we have some different looks at it. The church has a common misconception that we have to sit and stoically take whatever comes our way with God's plan without ever saying a word. See, as a church, how many times do we actually come in and communicate? You know, Westmoreland's great about it because we have our testimonies, but how many churches regularly communicate what God is doing in their lives, good or bad? Like, how many churches actually act as a community rather than just coming to sit in here and just let things and times pass by while we are just pieces of furniture <laughs> in a building, right? See, we shouldn't ask questions um, and grin and bear it in the eyes of many. Um, that's what the church thinks, but this isn't the truth. Well, not the church, but a lot of Christians, you know. <laughs> in the scripture, we see many people who strive for holiness, people who had lived great lives, they ask God questions. They be confused. They get confused by his actions, and some even bargain with them. Now, I don't suggest you do that unless you have the prophet title on your name because, you know, bargaining with God is not a great path to go down. But having a relationship with God involves interacting with him, and that includes asking questions. So imagine if, you know, I'm with my wife, and I'm confused about something, but I just, you know, bite my tongue and I never ask any questions about it over and over and over again. How do you think that's going to go? You know, if you have a friend like that and you just never talk to them and ask questions for clarification and they're like, um, hey, we're going to meet up here. And you're never, you just didn't hear them right, but you don't ask them. <laughs> Where did they say? You're never going to see each other. <laughs> it's never going to work out. Uh, questions are essential to any relationship. <clears throat> see? See, we see God ask us questions too. And that's interesting because he knows everything. <laughs> so he's asking them out of formality at that point. He's asking us, them not for his sake, but he's asking them to see us grow. And he wants us to ask questions back for us to grow in that form too. So asking God though, why, why and questioning our faith, it can make us feel extremely guilty, right? And honestly, it makes us feel like fake Christians. But what if I told you that this has to be a has the potential to be a powerful tool of God, right? I'm by no means saying you should go around looking for reasons to doubt God. But when you have questions in regards to your faith and you find these answers to these questions in God, your faith grows immensely, right? So we look at the life of Job. He, um, he questioned everything that was happening around him. I mean, it took him a long time to get to that point, but... You know, and God had to have a conversation with him. But out of that situation, do you see how much he multiplied? God multiplied him and his faith grew. I'm sure he, yeah, it's hard to, but he believed in God much more after, after all of that than he did before. Because only God could have got him through all of that. <laughs> right? So 
We say God wants a relationship with us, and then we act like we don't expect him to do anything. It's like adding someone on Facebook and you just go away, <laughs> right? You know, have you ever got a friend request and then you add that person and you just never like their post, you never comment anything, you just scroll through the feed, you know? <laughs> Maybe that's for the younger ones, I don't know. <laughs> but we, um, we act like we... We, we say, okay, let's have a relationship, but then we don't expect to do anything ourselves. We don't expect him to do anything. Involving God in our conversations and question is a great and spiritually healthy action. So four, to kind of tie this all together, is it's important to surrender. Verse 38 says, she said, behold the maid servant of the Lord, Right? So Mary stopped there for a second and was like, I don't know what's going on. Let me process all of this. And then she said, whatever your will, God, I'm going to submit. So it's okay to be confused with God, to wrestle with situations that he has placed in your life. And it's okay to question them. There are a, a major, <laughs> there, this is, these are a major part of what it means to seek God. Although beyond doing all the three of these things, Mary surrendered to the will of God. So <clears throat> I'm going to read the whole verse 38 for you just to have it as a whole. Then Mary said, behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So despite having these questions and being perplexed and confused, Mary had a desire to submit humbly to the will of God. The last step of submitting is what keeps, from, um, keeps the first three situation from causing us to become bitter and arrogant. So if you have all those questions and you have all these um, confusion, that's okay. But if you don't submit to the will, of God at the, the will of God at the end, that's when they become problems, right? That's the difference between your faith skyrocketing and you becoming farther and farther away from God and bitter towards God and angry, right? <clears throat> or even arrogant. You know, what that, the reason for that is you chose to believe in your own will rather than God's will. You think, I know better. And I don't know about you, but I'm never going to be the one to say I know better than God because you know, <laughs> that's a scary route. Now, despite never wanting to say that, how many times I have myself, have I stepped down a path and chose my own decision rather than what God's told me to do? We all make mistakes, right? But we have serve a forgiving and wonderful God. <clears throat> See, this process causes us to put our trust in God. Otherwise, we will be waiting forever to make our own decisions or looking for every single answer before we decide to look to God and submit before we lay down our hurt and bitterness. Now, you can answer these questions. You can ask God all the questions in the world, right? You can just constantly ask him questions. But there's got to be a part of you that accepts there are things that he does that you're never going to fully understand. So you cannot sit there and keep asking God questions without submitting to his will. You have to do it simultaneously. You know, he'll keep revealing things through, you, through his wisdom, but you have to submit. See, in Luke 5, 5, we see a similar situation where Jesus tells Peter's, Peter to cast his nets in a different place after a night of unsuccessful fishing. And Peter agreed because Jesus said so. He submitted to the will of God. Peter was a professional fisherman. And what Jesus said to do didn't make any sense to him. But he did it because Jesus said so. This is the same submission that Mary showed. And it is the same submission we must show if we want to see the goodness of God and as big of a capacity as we are able. When it doesn't make sense, when we are afraid, when we have questions, this is okay but it can all be overcome when we submit because he said so. Let us pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord God, you are so wonderful, Lord. I just can't ex stop exalting your name, Lord, because I that's all we really are capable of doing is lifting you on high and praising you and worshiping you, Lord. And even that is not a fraction of what you deserve, Lord God. Lord, we just accept your gift of salvation, Lord, upon our lives. And for those of us who aren't saved, Lord, I pray that we draw closer to you, Lord, and don't go another moment <clears throat> without giving our lives to you, Lord. But help us to remember that being born again is just forgiven and that salvation is an eternal process, Lord God. Lord, don't let us just cast 
keep casting our nets on the wrong side of the boat without listening to you, Lord. Lord, we pray that you continue to take us on this journey and to guide us and to take us the way you would have us to go. And if anyone would, I would pray that I ask that you come to the altar right now and just let the God spirit of spirits minister to you, Lord. And if any of you haven't given your life to God, <laughs> there's no better time than the present. <clears throat> he said for us to die daily. And that goes for us who have gone away from him too. It's not just those who, not just those who haven't started the process. It's those who continue to stay on it. You know, it's, it's, it's not easy. And we here as the family of God, we're understanding of that. And we're not here to judge you. We are here to help you get closer to God in every step. So <clears throat> don't let embarrassment hold you back. But just to be in the presence of God is the most glorious thing. And we don't get that opportunity as often as I would like. So Lord, we just come to you right now, Lord, and we offer ourselves to you, Lord. We fully submit to your will, Lord God. Lord, if there's something in our lives, we have been running away from you, much like the prophet Jonah did. We pray that you forgive us, Lord, and accept our submission, Lord God. Lord, let people submit in their households, Lord. Let men submit to God, Lord, and just to be leaders, Lord God. Let women submit to God, Lord, and just let them to fulfill their roles, Lord, and let men fulfill their roles, Lord. I pray that you just anoint everyone and anoint us as we all go out of here in Jesus' name. And I can't leave without saying this. Before you leave, tell three people that you're blessed and highly favored. Amen. God bless you. We will see you in 2022.